let me let me actually start with you, Professor Matu. What stands out for you? I mean, I could list three or four or five things, but what leaps out for you as the summit draws to a close? I think overall the consensus, the Delhi Declaration, of course, stands out. But the ability of India to convene a gathering like this and to be able to coordinate uh, multiple leaderships in a manner in which you could arrive a statement like the one you did, I think that stands out. Putin didn't come because of the Ukraine war. Xi Jinping because he wanted to snub India. But their absence was not really felt. You arrived at a statement that all the leaders of these G20 countries were comfortable with. And it was India, under India's presidentship that this was done. I think the fact that if India's arrival, as much as Beijing's arrival after the Beijing Olympics um, in 2008, India's arrival has been announced. And in particular, do you think, Amitabh, that this is India taking the mantle, uh, you know, as it were, of being uh, taking on the mantle of being a bridge builder, a consensus builder? Yeah, I think uh, the fact that India was able to engage with the Russians, arrive at a statement which both the Russians, the United States, as well as the self-righteous Europeans were comfortable with, without condemning Russia, but also talking about the importance of territorial integrity and how the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons was clearly inadmissible, suggests that India is also has the space and the agency to provide a platform for where people can come and dialogue, resolve important problems, much in contrast to what China stands for today, which is aggression, belligerence, and getting people into a debt trap, which is what the BRI has amounted to. Uh, co coincidentally, the World Bank released the India Stack report, I mean, its own version of the India Stack report, which suggested that the digital inclusion infrastructure that India had created could be a model. The India Stack could be a model for the rest of the world. So here is India's soft digital infrastructure, which is available free to the whole world to copy, replicate, scale, compared to BRI, which essentially is a Chinese project to make people dependent on China. And as you've seen in many of the cases of the countries that have uh, become part of that BRI, become totally dependent in terms of debt uh, traps that have been laid out for them. Let me... Uh, um... All, all, all uh, sort of excellent points, but let me take them as it were to Alex Trevelli. Alex, if I can, if I can bring you in now, uh, you know, the fact is that there are a lot of people who pulled out the Bali declaration of last year and said that, look, that spoke of quote unquote deplorable aggression by the Russians. This doesn't condemn Russia. Uh, that spoke of war against Ukraine. This is war in Ukraine. This is obviously masterful words with Ray. The Indians are very triumphant. Uh, what will be the reception back home in the United States? Will Biden be accused of going to softer India? Or will there be an understanding that this is, as Karan was just saying, very much India's moment. India is the countervailing, rising sort of antidote, as it were, uh, to China. Uh, how, how is this being received both in the media and, and you think by Joe Biden's colleagues? Thanks, Barka. I think that um, apart from the actual language that's used, what's probably going to take center stage, certainly in our coverage starting at a hurried pace yesterday afternoon, is that uh, the benchmark as set in Bali last November has moved and it's moved in the direction of the Russia-China axis. So although uh, the language that we see, I mean, points eight through 14 in the communique that was issued yesterday afternoon, um, are uh, perfectly clear in condemning aspects of the war, uh, the suffering involved. It echoes Prime Minister Modi's language about this not being a time of war and plenty of other things that everyone in the world can agree on, um, including uh, the importance of territorial integrity and sovereignty. You find not a single represent representative at the G20 who wouldn't disagree. But the important thing, I think, for those of us used to watching sports or any other sort of great power contest is that the needle moved and it moved away from the G7 and the Western interests in supporting Ukraine against Russia a little bit towards um, the Russian Chinese side. And I think that that was a surprise in part because there was a perhaps naive hope uh, going right into the G20 on the part of 
the G7 powers, that with his uh, surprising absence, Xi Jinping, uh, along with Putin, whose absence was in no way surprising, had given ground to this, uh, what America sees as a hopeful strategic partnership uh, between itself and India, as if by not being in the room, uh, China and Russia were less likely to get language that they um, would appreciate in the end. And, and so it was a bit uh, of a surprise to see a more uh, compromised statement appear. But what I would point out is that even more than one, there being a statement in the first place, which was very impressive, yeah. surprising. And two, you know, however the needle moved, I think it's inarguable that it moved uh, away from America and towards China, if those, those are the only two powers you were so, looking so, at. So, 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 so let me come in there, because I think India would see this entire three days as, as something that moved, uh, was a big, big message to China and that therefore moved against China. So I'm intrigued uh, that you would say that you saw the needle move toward China. Can, can you explain what that means? Oh, absolutely. In fact, there was one point in the final declaration that was, I think, an explicit, uh, ex made explicitly in deference to China, or I should say implicitly in deference to China. China this year, you remember, so last year in the Bali statement, um, China was a signatory to the, the final declaration, which said that war of aggression, as Russia's done in Ukraine, yada, yada, is a bad thing. Um, this year, China said it signaled it was not going to sign the same language as it had agreed to in Bali last year. And the reason it gave was different than Russia's reason. They said the G20 is supposed to be a grouping only for addressing economic matters, not geopolitics, matters of war and peace. Mm -hmm. So I can't I think it's point 11. One of the points after the peace section of this communique yesterday read, although the G20 is meant to address economic matters, it must be admitted that war and peace have various economic effects. And to that extent, only that extent, we abhor what's happening. And that seems like uh, making a quite generous amount of ground for the Chinese position, even while technically frustrating it. Well, that's so, I, I'm just smiling because it is such a different position or such a different perspective, General Sharma, uh, from how Indians are looking at this moment. The way day one ended with the announcement of the economic corridor, Alex, that was seen as a kind of direct, here you are, China, with your Belt Road Initiative. Uh, here's our snap to you. But Alex says that from the Western perspective, this obviously did not take the Western position on Russia and Ukraine. Of that, there is no doubt. And it is also true that it did not condemn Russia in the way that the Bali Declaration did. But the fact is, it still called for just and durable peace in Ukraine. It still spoke about a uh, secession of military attacks on relevant infrastructure. Uh, but it's interesting. There are very different perspectives of the same of the same developments. General Sharma, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Barka. The fact is that, you know, we it has become a hyperbole saying that uh, President Xi did not come. Uh, I would say that uh, a nation actually follows institutional positions and national positions. And uh, the premier who came here, Li Qiang, uh, is, a, is a favorite of the, of the president. So the position taken by the uh, Chinese is a position taken on behalf of President Xi and would have been discussed at that point. So to say that, you know, it is a differentiation between President Xi coming and not coming uh, had made a major position change to what China uh, stated and signed on is not correct. I think we uh, should say so. It would have made a difference if President Xi had come. But since he has not come, doesn't make earth-shaking difference at, uh, at all. Now, having said that, yes, there is a difference in Bali and all the footnotes that were added and all the yeah. asides that were given in, uh, in the Bali declaration. You know, the eight paragraphs that came in into this communique on uh, on um, Ukraine have been clearly crafted and it takes a balanced position. It uh, it uh, talks about Russia in a, in a mention about especially the grain deal. And um, subsequently, it also talks about Ukrainization. You see, the fact I would like to say is that since it was stated by media across the world and everybody who had a thought process saying that this um, the event is going to fail and the communique will not be signed and there will be no matching ground because there is a stringent position taken by the West and those taken by the China, by Chinese and Russians. I think what we achieved is a great uh, achievement in this, in, uh, in this form here. And um, I would also say that it is a measure of our telling the world that yes, we have arrived and we are a bridge. 